Hardware to Save a Planet explores the technical innovations that are giving us hope in the fight against climate change. Each episode focuses on a specific climate challenge and explores an emerging physical technology solution with the person bringing it into reality. I'm your host, Dylan Garrett. Hello and welcome to Hardware to Save a Planet. I'm here with Chris Tolls today, the co-founder and CEO of Yardstick. Chris and his team have developed a way to measure soil carbon accurately, instantly, and affordably. Access to data about soil carbon is a game changer in our ability to improve our food systems and also improve our land's ability to store carbon. So I'm looking forward to diving into that with Chris. I actually had a lot of fun, Chris, reading through your LinkedIn profile. Oh, what'd you see? <laughs> it's just, it's clear that you are a funny and honest person. You have a passion. I love that I don't even remember what I wrote, but yes, what you said is true. It's good. <laughs> I would recommend anybody take a spin through it. I've never had my LinkedIn profile recommended before. This is exciting. Tons of traffic. It's going to be great. Yeah. <laughs> it's a fun read. Yeah. you. It's clear you have a passion for helping people and the planet, and you have a really varied background. You have a degree in design, furniture design from Rhode Island School of Design. You've been involved in this really interesting mix of industries as an entrepreneur and consultant. I was going to spin through a few things that st stood out to me. You worked on a cooker powered by concentrated solar heat. You bet. One Earth Designs was the name of that company. Give it up, Scott Frank, Catlin Powers. Well done, co-founders. You worked for a company developing organs on a chip. Yes. Emulate. I got fired in week seven. That was a personal professional disaster, but a very cool company. <laughs> that was one of my one of the highlights from the LinkedIn profile read for me. Oh, it's on there. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, it says. Uh, I think the quote is, "I flamed out and was fired after seven weeks." <laughs> yes, you've mentored entrepreneurs through programs at Harvard and MIT. You've done some consulting for big healthcare companies, designing and launching new businesses. This was another favorite. You said. What I learned from this is that I never want to work in management consulting again. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> you never know what you're going to learn in different roles. Every experience is valuable, you know? <laughs> yeah. Your most recent business you sold in 2020, it was a daily gummy that would repair your skin from the inside out. And according to LinkedIn, as CEO and co-founder, one of your many responsibilities was janitorial services. That's true. So anyway, love your background, and I'm really excited to dig into this. Thanks for joining on the show. You bet. Before we link, leave my LinkedIn profile, though, I have a request to make of you and any listener. Um, if you could please endorse me for hostage negotiation, one of my goals is for that to be my most endorsed uh, skill on the otherwise useless skill UI element of LinkedIn. So this is a formal request for an upvote there, please. Hostage negotiate. Thank you. All right. We'll unleash the legions of Hardware to Save a Planet listeners on that task. Thank you. Yeah, thousands of yeah. <laughs> so I was going to ask, it, you've worked on such a wide variety of things. That, would it be fair to say a common thread is helping scientific innovations find commercial success? Is that a good way to think about it? Yeah. I mean, if you go down deep enough, like nothing doesn't have science, right? So... That's definitely true in the most general sense, and certainly more true as my career has, has gone along. I first got the science commercialization bug with that company, One Earth Designs, doing the solar cooker. That was a textbook university spin out founded here in, in Boston, Cambridge, out of MIT. That's what really got me turned on to like, wow, there's amazing stuff that happens in academic labs, and very few academic researchers have the knowledge or the skill or even the desire to turn things into companies. And what a remarkable opportunity if someone could just be good at taking pre-commercial science and making companies out of it. And I don't know if I'm good out of it, but I've definitely done it a few times. And that's really the theme of my career for some time now is, is science commercialization, being the business guy alongside a scientist or engineer co-founder. How do you find your either your co-founders or the innovations that you want to focus on? All different ways. Again, mostly unsuccessfully. I The best example 
of this is really like immediately before my last company and immediately before Yardstick, my current company. My last company, I was uh, consulting freelance to pay the bills while I was looking for Boston-based pre-commercial science to commercialize. That was pre-COVID. So it was mostly like walking around Cambridge and meeting researchers and saying, hi, (laughs) do you have a thing? I had a pretty crummy process at the time, which was about as sophisticated as I just described it. I now have a much better filter, of course, for conversations that are worth it or not worth it. But invariably, it would be some combination of like chemistry with the PI and then like the the soft power residing with the PI, the principal investigator at a a university, but the hard power resting with what's usually called tech transfer or tech licensing. There is usually IP that the university owned, and therefore it's the university that is signing that IP away to a company. So you had to kind of gain the trust and the approval of the researcher But ultimately, it was the institution's decision about whether they believed in you to start the company. And that was about an 18-month process, so like lots of false starts. I knew it would take a while, and thankfully, I was enjoying the process, so like I wasn't really in a rush. The first year, my wife and I agreed I would spend a year doing it, and I had to make 50 grand to break even on costs with like side hustle, freelancing stuff. The next year, I made more money freelancing than I had in my full-time job the year before. So after a year, we were like, let's keep doing this. This is great. And I only had one kid at the time. So life was a little simpler and met my my co-founder of that company, a woman named Amelia Jaworski, who's a a dermatology researcher here in the Boston area. Met her because we got introduced by a researcher here in Boston named Jeff Karp, who's pretty proactive and pretty atypical in that he proactively pulls teams together. So we worked on his IP for a bit. We told him, I love you, man. This is like a terrible business. Don't do it. And then Amelia was like, hey, Chris, like I got my own ideas, you know, and her idea was a fern compound for edible sunscreen. And I was like, that's nonsense, but send me a paper or two. And she did. And it is definitely not nonsense. And so we made a company. Yardstick was totally different. It was all in Slack because it was summer and fall 2020. So like less enabling of, you know, roaming around Cambridge, meeting people. In that case, it was the My Climate Journey Slack group. And by then I I had a much tighter playbook. I was pretty mercenary. I I haven't looked up my Slack posts, but I was pretty much like, hi, I want to start a company. I'm going to be the CEO. I know how to make money. (laughs) Are you a scientist? Do you want to do that? And I hope that I was, you know, kind and and human in that. But nonetheless, it was a a lot less roundabout. And my co-founder, Kevin Meissner, our CTO, he was right there in the Slack group. And he's like, actually, I have a thing around soil carbon measurement. And in his mind, it was probably going to be like a science project for a little while, but he he suspected it could be a company eventually. And I convinced him it should be a company right away. And here we are, three and a half years, coming up on four years later. So if you were focused in the My Climate Journey Slack, you had already kind of at least zeroed in on something climate focused. And what is it about soil carbon measurement that gets you excited? Aha. All right. It's a few things. Number one is like... We already manage 12 billion acres of agricultural land in the world, plus or minus. Like we've pretty much decided to operate every acre of land that can be productive in some way. And many climate solutions, I mean, all climate solutions require behavior change of some kind. What's kind of cool about agriculture is we're already making decisions. And so I don't have to like go find a new, you know, gold mine or like, I don't have to like put a rocket on Mars in a way I've never done before. What I need to do is I need to build a different set of incentives that sometimes like modestly change the behavior of existing agricultural operators, farmers and ranchers. Now, many tech people look at that and they say like, ooh, behavior change, like no thanks. So, you know, pros and cons, but nonetheless, I love that like we are currently using soils in a way that is going to destroy them. (laughs) And they are providing value in the immediate term, but the clock is ticking. And what a cool opportunity to like realign incentives so we can take all of that management and just like make it a little different, right? That to me is a more compelling problem than like figure out, you know, nuclear fusion. Obviously I can't help with the second problem and like maybe I can help with the first one, but still that's number one. Number two, pretty specific to the US, although not entirely, is I love how soil bridges the gap of culture and politics. Like most agriculture, I mean, the stereotype that agricultural people in the US are more politically conservative is true. And Yardstick can talk about soil health if you want to talk about soil health. Those aren't the same thing, but I love that 
There is a preservation of soil function argument to be made. There's a value prop to pursuing soil carbon solutions that isn't actually necessarily dependent on you caring about CO2E or emissions at all. Instead, it's about uh, preserving and restoring the thing that we need soils to do today, which is grow food and feed your family and feed your family, the farmer or the rancher. So a little bit of political isolation, especially these days, I think is, is both strategic and personally satisfying at Yardstick. And then the third is kind of just the numbers. Like the thing that caused me to, to start this company along with the rest of our, our awesome team can sort of be oversimplified to one plot. And we can include it in the show notes if, if you want. The x-axis is emissions potential for removals. This is talking about carbon removal specifically. And the y-axis is cost. And the bottom right, there's a box labeled soil carbon. <laughs> and the bottom right is where you want to be. It's a lot of tons and they're low cost. And literally like... I looked at that and I was like, how do we get that? How do I get that that part of the box? How do I get that part of the plot? And that box is being held back by measurement, which means well, let's fix measurement. Got it. So relative to like direct air capture, where the cost per ton is much higher, that would be the top left of your plot. Exactly. Yeah. And to be clear, like there are other performance criteria that matter, right? <laughs> there are, DAC is essentially important in a whole bunch of ways, but it is absolutely not competing on costs today. You know, the DAC person on your show would talk about the limitations of soil, human behavior and reversibility and ecological complexity and measurement. And those are all true things. Thankfully, I think the market is obviously emerging to value different things differently. Carbon is not a commodity. <laughs> a soil carbon removal ton and a DAC ton could not be more different. So I don't want to overemphasize that those two axes are the ones that matter most. But everybody agrees that that X axis of tons is essential. And then, you know, you can get into three and four and five and six dimension plots and argue about trade-offs for everything else. But no one says that cost doesn't matter. And especially for someone like myself that is profoundly impatient and can't wait decades for impact. The beauty of soil, like I said, is you touch it every day, right? Billions of people around the world touch it every day. I really admire people who know that they're signing up for a decadal or more scale problem with some of these other technologies. But that ain't me. At least it ain't me right now. So on the carbon removal side of it, can you quantify, is it, you know, in dollars per ton and total kind of potential gigatons removed kind of thing? What does that look like? Yep. So again, we can put it in show notes because people like IPCC, like actually <laughs> measure this stuff rather than improvising some numbers. But we can think about it a few ways. The first way, it's important to disambiguate price from cost. So price is what carbon buyers today will pay. Cost is, you know, how cheaply can you produce it? Today, prices for leading soil carbon tons are mostly in like the $30 to $40 range. There's some outliers. You can get really, really junky stuff for way less than that. But if we call this sort of like a new age of less shitty offsets, companies in this current generation of, of suppliers, soil is mostly in the $40 to $50 range for organic carbon. There's a whole kind of segmentation thing here around enhanced rock weathering and inorganic carbon, yada, 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 can get very complex. But the core business of like organic carbon, restoring those stocks, 30 to 40 bucks. Whereas most engineered solutions are actually selling today on the range of, you know, 500 to $1,500. And those are pre-purchases. Those aren't deliveries. Whereas company here in Boston, Indigo, difficult company, like very challenged in some key ways, but nonetheless, they've like minted 300,000 soil tons under a leading methodology and sold them, right? That's real impact today. So again, this sort of comes back to like, what do you care more about? If you care more about things that you can actually ship today, if you care more about inventory today, you're going to trend towards nature-based solutions, including soil. And in the meantime, that price differential, yeah, it can be 20X, you know, 30X between even expensive soil carbon tons today and most stack tons today. And just to say that it's really important because it, it really opens up the market for carbon removal purchases to companies that have a much higher kind of cost or sorry, much lower profitability per tons of emissions. The, the biggest emitters in the world. Totally. Yep. Are, it's not really feasible for them to be compensating their emissions with $600 a ton credits, right? Nailed it. Yeah. Yep, exactly. And- I think this gets talked about sometimes and people get like big mad because they're like, 
but Shell is the one that did the polluting. And it's not like, to be clear, it's not like they have the money and they just don't want to spend it. It's like they literally don't have enough cash, like even at their scale. Like it's not like, it's not like a preference thing. It's like there's not enough money in their bank account and there never will be to pay hundreds of dollars a ton. Another reference we can put in the show notes if you want is another favorite plot of mine. The x-axis is total emissions by industry. And then the y-axis is total aggregate corporate profit per ton of emissions. And so each dot is an industry. And it basically says like, what's the relationship between, you know, cumulative profitability and emissions. And, you know, these data are related. So it's unsurprising that it's basically a line from the top left down to the bottom right. And what's essential is that in the bottom right, there's a dotted box. And that dotted box represents 85% of global emissions and 15% of global profits. And 100% of those companies are below $100 in total profit. Total profit. Not like carbon willingness to pay, but like there's $100 of profit for every ton of emissions. <laughs> ton of emissions, right. Yes. So that kind of gives you the... The ceiling of their budget to exactly. purchase. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Which remember, like they also need to like invest in shit. <laughs> right. And like pay dividends. Yeah. Make some money. Yeah. And like, it's like carbon is not at the top of their list. So I look at that plot and I, I just decide that I want to be focused on nature-based solutions, which I think is the only thing that can do the bottom right of that plot. And when you look at the top left, it's all tech companies. And that's why you see the Stripes and the Microsofts leading a lot of engineered carbon removal. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. Microsoft actually is a great example of a company that's spanning the world of high durability engineered removal and lower durability, more affordable nature-based. They're not mutually exclusive, but at the end of the day, we need both. And I'm just like really stoked to be working in the bottom right. Yeah. So it's easy for me to think about this in terms of carbon removal. You also mentioned the benefits to kind of soil productivity and food production. Do you think about what you're doing as one side is more impactful than the other? Is it just both are really important? Can you talk about the other side of it? Yeah. So I think of it a few different ways. The first is like culturally or missionally, like we are a climate company first. We are not firstly an agricultural company. Sometimes people put us in like ag tech bucket and it always sort of like feels weird to me. I'm like, yeah, I guess we are. Like it's all agriculture, but like I'm not telling you how to farm differently. I mean, maybe indirectly I am, right? But like, I'm not making tools to help you farm better today. There are people at Yardstick who are deeply agricultural, but like they're the minority, right? They they have an essentially important role at the company, especially culturally. But like I grew up in New Jersey. I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I'm like textbook coastal elite. I live in Boston, but like I'm on the spectrum. I'm like the tech bro rather than like the farmer type. And so culturally climate is first. And our our number one core value says climate impact above all else. For me, agriculture is a means to an end. Like I find it fascinating and I'm so glad that I get to learn in it every day. But in terms of intrinsic motivation, you know, none of my employees who, who hear me say this will be surprised that like, yeah, it's, it's an amazing thing that I have a gift to be paid to learn about, but I'm not intrinsically motivated by agriculture. Other people at the company are, but I'm not. And so our, our sort of dominant priority between those two is not make agriculture work. It's like fix climate change. The second is like our customer base today, overwhelmingly similarly focused on the emissions aspect of what we're doing, but it's still an early adopter market, right? So we're talking to the like regenerative agriculture and supply chain emissions person at General Mills, right? Also, we work with a lot of scientists that are customers and more scientists are just going to be more intrinsically motivated by sort of the climate angle. Like we don't sell to farmers. We do the work on farmer and rancher land, but they are participating in the programs of our paying customers. Bigger picture though, and longer term, I actually think the total opportunity for impact and for dollars is actually biased towards the like, keep agriculture working value prop. And the best articulation of this is the work of our primary science advisor, this organization, the Soil Health Institute. They've done this study on both Midwest commodities and cotton. Cotton is brand new. Midwest Commodities is a few years ago. I think it was across 30 farms across eight states. So it's, it's quite comprehensive. And they looked at what they call soil health practices, which materially similar to regenerative agriculture, which itself doesn't have a definition, separate argument. But you can think of it as just like, hey, all the good things that we wish we would be doing. 
And they looked at the on-farm economics of farms deploying soil health practices and farms that are not. And they basically said, like, what's the bottom line implication? And unsurprisingly, for most people who are working in the sector, like farms that deploy soil health practices make more money. They have lower cost of inputs and they have either preserved yields or slightly lower yields, but their input cost is much lower. So their actual gross margin per acre is greater. And part of the challenge is when fertilizer companies are doing most of the, when fertilizer and seed companies are doing most of the storytelling to farmers, it's like yield, 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 right? Like bushels. And what SHI has done a great job of being like is like, you, f- you feed your family with gross margin. <laughs> you know, you, you don't feed your family with bushels. And frankly, if it's bushels, it's probably corn. It's probably not for humans anyway. <laughs> you don't feed your family the ethanol that your corn uh, gets turned into. And that that I find just so inspiring. Like, I actually think it would be really cool if we didn't talk about climate at all and just talked about like the market's existing appetite to just like maximize economic value. That has downsides, right? Like we see like markets get really fucked up when they do that. They harm people. So there are downsides to all of this. It's all trade-offs. But between the argument of like, now is the time when we're actually going to internalize all the costs of climate change and like, it's just a better way to make money. I find the second argument to just be like way more likely to resonate with the middle of the adoption curve. And that's not a moral judgment. Like I, I, that's how I behave in my own world a lot of the time. I'm a business person, right? Like this is a corporation. Right. These are businesses. Yeah. Totally. These are businesses. And for better or worse, Yardstick like, is working within the business motivations of these firms. And so when, when Soil Health Institute does that work, I'm like, hell yeah. Let's just like, let's just keep, you know, agricultural policy in the US is definitely more focused on like preserving agricultural productivity than it is on climate, right? Probably 101, 101 resources on the former which means great. If I'm a, an enabler of the former, acknowledging the downside, right? How cool that you can make a system less harmful, healthier, more resilient, and reduce emissions at the same time. That gets me riled up. Right. What do people, what do growers do with data you provide? So I, as I understand it, you provide the measurement, but then something has to change about practices to improve that measurement. Exactly. Yep. What are the behavior changes we're talking about? Yeah. So importantly, our, the farmers don't tend to use our data directly. So let's use an example where General Mills is my customer. They're paying yardstick. General Mills, let's say the Cheerios brand, goes out to the oats farmers of the Dakotas and says, hey, we're doing this pilot. We'll compensate you for lower emissions. Maybe we'll bear some of the fixed costs of uh, changing practices. Do you want to enroll in this program? And an early adopter farmer says, yeah. That means Yardstick is doing measurement work on the land of that farmer, but it's General Mills who's our paying customer. So we're providing that data to General Mills. Sometimes we're also providing it to the farmer, but that's kind of General Mills and the farmer's business, right? Like they get to decide how data is shared internally. And by now there's enough skepticism from farmers around data sharing that any farmer who's enrolling is like, you better show me, you know, what what information you collect about my farm. But the farmer is not our customer. The farmer is the one changing their management practices to hopefully accomplish lower emissions, which is what General Mills wants to get. But what are the economics that incentivize those management practice change? Again, that's General Mills' business. Do they pay a little bit more per bushel of oats? Do they give you preferential supplier treatment? Do they feature you in their ESG newsletter, right? Do they help you buy a no-till drill because you have to plan things differently? There's a bunch of different ways that money flows, but when my customer is a food brand, the behavior change is not directly a product of our measurement data. Instead, we're basically reflecting a T equals zero starting line, and then a T equals three years, five years, which is the the so what of the intervention. So at a systems level, then a General Mills is saying, wow, you know, reduction in tillage worked excellently in this county and poorly in that county. What does that tell us about tailoring, changing management plans on a, you know, per county basis? But no one is like, when we do measurement in field, it's not like the farmer sitting in the tractor, like waiting for us to finish so they can like choose the right setting on the tractor. That's not the way our data is used. It's not agronomic, I guess would be the, the simplest way to put it in the immediate term. Before Yardstick, was this data not available or was it, was it really hard to get? Really hard to get and therefore not available. It would... 
pretty much only be measured in research contexts. Part of why we lack high quality measurement tools for soil carbon is because there's never been a commercial scale economic reason to measure soil carbon. I mean, there's always been like curious people and there's always been, you know, think of like all the human health hacker types, right? You're like, why are you measuring all this stuff? And they're like, oh, because my, you know, intermittent fasting and the blah, blah, blah. But like, they're the exception that proves the rule, which is most people don't even go to the doctor, you know? Yeah. So no, there has not been any historic measurement of soil carbon at scale outside of pretty wonky soil science research context. And what's your innovation to make it possible? We do spectroscopy, which means a fancy movie. So the regular way to measure soil carbon is a stainless steel core, a tube of steel that you smash into the ground, pull it out of the ground with the soil, open it up, mail the soil to a lab, they run a machine, they give you a number. That works in that it's mature, but it doesn't work in terms of economics. So we're replacing that laboratory analysis with an optical technology. It looks like a big hand drill. We can add a link uh, if you want to see a, a demo of it. But imagine drilling into the soil and there is a lens at the tip of the drill. So as you're drilling, you're taking a movie of the soil profile and then you are calculating the same soil property from that movie than you would with a lab. It's point of care diagnostics, but for soil carbon. So you're getting an instant instant measurement. You can, because it's not actionable instantly. Like we don't actually have to display it on the device, you know, but, but technically, yes, uh, it can be instant. More typically, you're doing a whole day of measurement. You're syncing it to the cloud. The results show up on the web portal, but it's not a technical barrier that it's not real time. It's just a, a functionality, lack of desirability barrier. And your co-founder, what was the innovation? What was new about what they were working on? So he hadn't worked on this at all when we started the company. He had met the soil scientists that had done the academic. I mean, he had conceptualized some stuff. They did a, a grant proposal that was successful. So he had done a little planning work and a little you know basement hacking work. But he was previously at Planet Labs and SpaceX. He's a mechanical engineer by training. So he's done precision sort of mechanical engineering. He co-founded a company called Charm Industrial that's doing biomass based carbon removal as well. And he found that same plot where soil carbon's in the bottom right, asked that same question, what's holding it back? And cold emailed the researcher that had done the best research into measurement. They got together on a grant proposal in early 2020, which was awarded in fall 2020. And so in typical, you know, white guy CEO fashion, I showed up right before the money did. But that meant he and I were, were starting actually from a similar perspective of no, no sector, no industry expertise in soil carbon measurement before Yardstick, which means... Every time people talk to someone at Yardstick and are impressed with how smart we are, or particularly me, it's really just because I listen to Christine Morgan and then I say the same thing. And people are like, wow, <laughs> you're really smart. And I'm like, I mean, like, I guess, I guess that's like how learning works. But as you pointed out, I went to RISD undergrad. The only things I know about soil carbon, I, I learned from SHI. What's challenging about your hardware? How has that process gone? I'm curious kind of how mature the hardware is and you know, what kind of physical engineering challenges you've had to overcome to get to where you're at? One of the biggest challenges is the variability of soils. Like it's just, it's infinite. You know, people often use the metaphor of human populations and variability in humans, but like there's just way more variability in soils than there are in humans. Moisture content, texture, parent material, you know, actual terrain, right? Like measuring soil carbon on flat as a board, 40 acres in Iowa is completely different from 75,000 acre ranch in the middle of nowhere, Montana, where there's a river in the middle of it. You know, durability is challenging, right? This is a field instrument. And so invariably it's just going to get tossed in the back of some ATV. So how do you have both precision and rough and, and readiness? Spectroscopy is a pretty mature discipline, but it's dominated by academics. And so the way to think about Yardstick's hardware is like when you buy a DSLR from Canon, the sensor inside it is made by probably some Taiwanese firm. And like the sensor is not the camera, right? Like Canon had to do an insane amount of work to make a good camera. It's the same thing. Our spectrometer is actually commercial off the, off the shelf, which is good. One does not want to design a custom spectrometer. That's a totally different discipline and enormously difficult and expensive. But Canon, you know, 20 years ago was 30 years ago was buying commercial off the shelf sensors for digital cameras and being like, wow, it's yeah, I got a sensor, but like 
I do not have a camera. And so it's the same engineering barrier of like, how do you take a component and embody it in a hardware, in a piece of hardware that can actually do the job? We need reference scanning, spectrometers drift. We have an internal shutter that needs to be actuated. We need it to be wireless and handheld and durable. You'll see in the video, it's powered by the same drill batteries that power the drill. We use an off-the-shelf drill because Makita has spent, you know, probably a billion dollars of engineering on the drill. We should probably not try and redo the drill. So that that's really the central mechanical challenge is taking this ostensibly mature sensor and putting it in a package that actually results in the thing we're trying to do. And even once you get the hardware performing well, you have to train it on soils. And so the data collection aspect of this is very challenging because it has to come from you know, various farms and ranches, which means you need to go there. You know, that's why you see so many of these companies that'll tell you they can measure soil carbon from outer space, because it's just like, it's really easy to deploy a piece of software if you don't have to go there. Soil carbon's underground. So like satellites can't see under there. That's why we focus on the proximal piece of the equation. But even when our instrument is working exceptionally well, you still have the calibration complexity of cool, spinning up a new customer. I was talking to somebody in Ireland earlier today. And they're like, what, ex- what? how much of your library is, is Ireland? And I'm like, zero. <laughs> and so now we're getting into just the unit economics of like, where do we collect training data? What regions do we prioritize? What crop types do we prioritize? How do we spin up new regions with calibrations that are transferable? The data science aspect of our hardware is as significant, if not more significant a challenge than the actual mechanical dimensions of what we're doing. So I know that you worked with Cambridge consultants for some of the development. Yes. I'd be really curious. So Cambridge consultants is a essentially a sister company of my company Synapse. Yep. We work together as one big team under the same parent company, Capgemini. I'm curious how you made the decision to outsource some of the design and and if there's any kind of tips you would give to other founders about when that's the right decision or not. Yep. So it's hard for me to generalize, but I can talk about our experience, which is that we needed expert capacity faster than we can get it by hiring. And the nature of the work is super multidisciplinary. It's a bit of optics. It's a bit of mechanical. It's a bit of data science. It's a bit of materials. And so this was a crunch period of early 21, I think it was. No, early 22. I don't even remember. One of those two where we realized like, oh shit, we just got to like move faster and we're behind on hiring and I can't hire one eighth of eight different disciplines, right? So there was a critical piece of hardware that we needed to get out the door in order to hit a calibration milestone. I mean, so we were very transparent with the team about like, hey, here, here's why we're doing this, which means like, I'm not sure that this is going to continue long to long, go long term. And, you know, we're, we're a poor startup, <laughs> but it was an amazing fit. And they did awesome work to build a bench embodiment of our spectral probe that taught us a ton about how to think about the various like subunit engineering problems of our total problem. And it was an amazing way for us to rapidly access a a really diverse set of disciplines because yardstick doesn't work if we can't combine excellent optical engineering, mechanical engineering, materials engineering all in one. And now our hardware team is, you know, four-ish people. So we can, we can have some electrical, right? And at the time we just didn't. And so we realized like, man, I'm glad I've been hanging out with Mike Dunkley here in Boston for a few years because now I'm I'm texting him saying, oh shit, (laughs) do you know anybody? So we worked uh, mostly with a team in the UK, Neil Matram, Motram, I forget exactly how to say his name, but... Yeah, Matram, yeah. We had a, a great experience with them, and, and Neil's been, continued to be involved in various sort of like ag and climate things. We recommend, I at least recommend them very highly to other teams who meet either of those criteria. Needed on short notice, and you got more cash than time, or particularly like multidisciplinary problems where you're not confident that hiring across all of those disciplines right away is going to be successful. We ask every guest what they hope our audience learns from the episode. And, you know, we almost always get the blurb about why their solution is great, kind of what you'd expect. Well, you wrote, and I'll just, I'm just going to read it. You wrote that you believe that income inequality and white supremacy are at least as important as climate change in terms of existential risks to humanity. The intersection of the chemistry problem of climate change and the political, economic, cultural context which created it is unavoidable, is an unavoidable part of the conversation. 
And I read that and I was kind of like, oh shit, like I'm an engineer, man. That's amazing. I don't remember writing that, but I'm not surprised. You caught me on a on a spicy Friday afternoon, I guess. <laughs> I guess my question about that is, you know, I have some awareness of that. It seems to be kind of gaining some momentum in the sort of conversation in the climate community. I'm curious how your awareness of that influences any decisions you make in your work. It definitely does. I'm not sure it does helpfully. Like I bring that up because I am a wrestler with it rather than an expert in it. <laughs> and I mean, obviously, like nobody wants to hear from another white man in power, you know, talking about inequality. But I think it's exactly the kind of people that need to be talking about inequality, right? Because addressing many of these problems has, since the beginning of time, been the burden of people suffering under systems of inequality rather than people in power like myself. So it shows up a few ways. One is kind of the first thing I talked about of like, like within climate, I think there's a lot of techno optimism, which is great. Like we're talking on the internet, you know, like what an amazing thing, right? The internet is a product of people that like believe that like science and technology could like solve problems better. Love it. So grateful for that. You know, again, I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts. These are, you know, you got more techno optimist per capita, you know, here than almost anywhere else, except probably some parts of San Francisco. And yet, like, can you destroy the master's house with the master's tools? You know, like, and I think agriculture is a perfect example of this. A lot of people in the regenerative agriculture movement talk about the green revolution as like, when it all started going wrong. And I think that's both a, a privileged worldview because most of the people I hear talking about that, like will never struggle to get enough calories, right? And I think it's just kind of like ahistorical, like the green revolution, like there are some dissenting perspectives, but broadly speaking, people who study it are like, this saved more lives than like probably any other singular like technological transformation in, in the history of the world. And nonetheless, I think it's important to acknowledge that if we grant the Green Revolution those successes, we are now inheriting a lot of the oops, second order effects of it, right? And that doesn't mean that like, I don't know, we shouldn't have done it or it's bad. It just means like both things are true. I believe it was enormously successful in the ways it was successful, and it has created enormous problems in the ways it has created enormous problems. And a lot of culture, especially like white intellectual culture, wants to net those out. They want to find a mean of those two values so we can simplify it, right? And agree, like good or bad. And like false dichotomies are a part of white supremacy. And so instead, like what I'm trying to do is, is hold space for it was amazing in the ways it was amazing. And it was terrible in the ways that it's terrible. And I'm working on some of the terrible parts of it right now while enjoying the benefits of the way it was amazing. Similarly, the market, you know? Capital and capital systems, which is the one yardstick exists in and can't not exist in. Amazing at some things, terrible at other things. How is it possible, I think, to have like a personal culture and a company culture and at greater and greater scales that I think can hold these things in tension and can tolerate the paradox and avoid the temptation to like net those out? A lot of climate tech VCs freak out if you talk about degrowth. And it's like, Really? I don't know. And I mean, like the way they describe it, it like really is worth freaking out about. I mean, like never listen to climate tech Twitter. It's like the most dramatic, unnecessary place in the world. But the other day I saw someone post and he was basically like, degrowth is the single most poisonous ideology on planet Earth today. Like, hang on. Like you can't come up with any more poisonous ideology. It's like, come on, buddy. Right. Uh, but like people really believe that. And so... Anytime you have the like regen ag people that are like, if we just went back to the way things were, that's a partial truth, right? And you have the techno optimists that say like, whenever the problem is, science will fix it. What they usually mean is they'll fix it for me or my kids or my part of San Francisco first. And they're usually right about that. So how instead, I don't know, can, Twitter is not the place for nuance. So I'm not surprised it doesn't show up there. And sometimes nuance can obscure in really unhelpful ways, right? Like find people on both sides is nuance. But nonetheless, I want to be someone that can like draw from the master's tools. And I do, right? Like I have an amazing salary that I wouldn't have <laughs> without capital. 
and also be like, and at the same time, how do we keep our eyes out for the ways that it's not serving us well? Did we get there? Did we fix it? I don't know. That's kind of what that means to me. I wish we had more time to dig into it, but I appreciate you bringing it up. Life is long. We will talk again, I'm sure. (laughs) I do have three questions that I ask everybody at the end of the episode. And if you're good with it, let's hit those quickly. So the first is how optimistic or pessimistic are you about the future of the planet and why? I'm 100% both because evidence. Who is another company or individual doing something to address climate change that's inspiring you? Or actually, wait, no, I'm 100% both. And I'm pessimistic because of the past. And I am hopeful because I have children. Love it. And I can see the way that they are so different than me. (laughs) Love it. Who is another company or individual doing something to address climate change that's inspiring you? Megan O'Connor runs Nth Cycle here in Boston doing batteries recycling. And she's a wild animal and she has a big heart and I adore her. And there are very few people in the world I would consider working for. And she's one of them. I would love to do an episode on that, actually. I haven't focused on that topic. You should. She's a force of nature. Awesome. What advice do you have for someone not working in climate today who wants to do something to help? Whatever you're good at, climate needs. Climate is, in, is encompassing of everything, literally everything. There is a climate angle to everything on the planet. So whether it's an industry that you know or a functional role that you're good at, there is one of those for climate. Awesome. Chris, that was a really fun and inspiring conversation for me. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Appreciate you having me. Hardware to Save a Planet is brought to you by Synapse. To find out more about us and how we develop hardware solutions for the world's most ambitious companies, head to synapse.com. And then make sure to search for Hardware to Save a Planet in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, or anywhere you like to listen. Make sure to click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Synapse, thanks for listening.